Good evening. I, I'm Andy Walker. I'm the assistant vice president on the network programs. We help to coordinate the speakers for the dinner that you're at this evening as, on, and every month, as well as the semi-annual Crystal City Dinner. This is our main feature event that we have for the chapter, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our featured speaker this evening, Mr. David S. Maurer, Lieutenant Colonel Army, Lieutenant Colonel U.S. Army, retired. Dave serves as the senior vice president with Inverness Technologies, a federal contracting firm here in Northern Virginia. His principal duties involve two outstanding programs focused on our military veterans, the Military Transition Assistance Program, TAP, and the Disabled Transition Assistance Program. He is a former board member of our own PMI chapter, as well as the Washington Chapter of Association of the United States Army and the USO Metropolitan New York City. While serving the nation for 22 years as an active duty Army officer, Dave held dozens of leadership positions across the United States and overseas, including several tours as a commander and executive officer to senior military and civilian leaders. He has served as the joint staff in the Pentagon and with one of our intelligence agencies here in Washington. He retired from the Army in 1999 as the 72nd Adjutant General of the United States Military Academy at West Point. As a professional speaker and trainer, Dave's audiences and clients have included the World Bank, the CIA, the FBI, the U.S. Marshal Services, the Department of Homeland Security, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, several project management chapters, the Performance Institute, and both large and small enterprises within the private sector. He has presented at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., and has guest lectured for the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government, Virginia Tech, the University of Maryland, and selected faculty members at West Point. Dave is a member of the National Speaker Association and co-author of a book dealing with interpersonal skills in a project management setting. He is busy writing two more books right now, one on leadership in general, and the other is a collaborative effort dealing with the leadership principles in play in the White House Presidential Emergency Operations Center on 9-11, also known as the Underground Bunker. Dave is most proud of his great family, including his three grown and successful sons, two of whom proudly serve our nation as active duty soldiers and are combat veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dave Maurer. Good, Good evening. Everybody hear me okay? No? Do I have to use my command voice? First of all, congratulations to the, uh, to the chapter very near and dear to my heart as a former board member. Congratulations on our 10,000th member. It's great to have all the past presidents here. There's a joke going through my head. I won't tell it. You know, how many past presidents does it take to uh, run an organization? But we're, I'm so glad you're all here. Um, you know, I heard someone, we were talking about our 10,000th member earlier, and I heard a pretty weak woo-hoo, woo-hoo. Um, look, I was in the Army for 22 years. So where are my fellow soldiers? How does this go, guys? Hua. Uh, that's a Marine over there. Where's the Marines? Marine? <laughs> By the way, if I may, in, uh, as you heard in the introduction, I've, I'm a, it's kind of a military family. If you have served in the military or a family member of someone who serves, would you please stand up so we can applaud for you? That's, that's quite a few. Thank you all for your service and for your dedication and the risks that you've taken. Well, it's so much fun to be here. What a great night to be uh, the guest speaker when you, we've got all this hoopla. I don't usually get champagne. This is, this is new to me. I kind of liked it. So my wife is here, so I think we're going to hit the store on the way home. And, or if there are any empty bottles, please bring them forward as you're ready to leave. Uh, this is a presentation that's a little bit different. It's, it's not all about project management, though I promise we will talk about project management. And, and for Ron Taylor, who was president while I was on the board, Ron, this is for you. Project management, project management, project management. <laughs> the joke is that the speaker sometimes neglects to mention what the project management connection might be. So just in case I forget to do that, I wanted to get three 
hits in there on project management. But we, this, we will talk about it and how it relates to us as, as project managers, as leaders, and as followers. Uh, the title of this, as you can see, is branded. Is this who I am and is this what I do? What I wanted to try to talk about this evening is, is probably near and dear to most of us as I look around the room. And that is, maybe it's time for a little introspection. And I don't think we do that often enough in our busy, hectic, day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and I'm as much to blame uh, and, uh, uh, as anyone else. It's busy out there. We're working, we're driving, we're texting, we're, we're on the phone, we're doing all kinds of things. We don't often take time to just sit and think about ourselves, our lot in life, what we've done, what we want to be when we grow up. Is there anybody in this room who knows what they want to be when they grow up? I sure don't. And if you do, good for you. You're, you're among the very few that, that have figured it out. Uh, I'm 55 and I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, as you'll determine at the end of this presentation, being a speaker is probably not what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> you might want to give me some additional direction. So I thought about my life, about my professional life, and where I am, and where I was, and what I want to do, and I thought about it in a project management kind of setting. So I thought I'd share that with you today. Uh, this is one of the few slides, you'll see this a couple times, I did not run spell check on this, so I hope it's Oh, come on, I worked on that for like two weeks. <laughs> it was a J until I fixed it and found out it's an H. Anybody want to guess what that H might stand for? Ooh. No, well, it's good. <laughs> it does now. <laughs> now, really, anybody have a, now, we're talking about introspection, where are we, is this what I want to do, is this who I am? Happy. Happy. Think about being happy tonight. Think about being happy in your lives, in your professional lives, and what you're doing for yourself, for your family, for the people around you. And if you're not happy, start thinking a little harder about what can make you happy so you can, you can get to that, to that place. So I want to, uh, you'll see this a couple times. I'm going to come back to it a few times. But come back to that happy, that happy place, OK? So who am I? Am I a good dad? Am I a good husband? Am I a good brother? or sister, or daughter, or boss. How many of, how many of us, uh, I'll ask rhetorically, as bosses, ever think about how am I doing as a boss? Now, if you've had the 360 degree survey done, you know how you're doing, at least in, in, with re, in relation to the people that were surveyed. But a lot of us don't take the time to do that. I'm glad some, some have. Because we're busy fighting the near battle. We're busy putting out fires. We call them hair fires in the Army, right? We're always, there's always something on fire that we have to go and, and extinguish. But how am I doing as a boss? How am I doing as a subordinate and as a colleague? So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and how do I define myself? Does that look familiar for those of us that are in the world of work, particularly in leadership positions? Between home and, and work, between staying home for the day and spending time with your family or getting back on the highway and going up to the office, whatever that happens to be, it's a true balancing act. And unless you're in the workforce and you understand that you're being tugged in a million different directions every day, it's kind of hard to understand what folks that are in the professional workforce have to go through in terms of balancing their work and their life. So this is often how I feel. I suspect that, that a lot of us feel that way, that this balancing act. So. We talked about introspection. Do, am I doing these things? Am I leading by example? Demonstrating loyalty. How about following? Do I follow well and faithfully? You know, sometimes being a leader isn't, isn't as difficult as being a good follower. Have you ever thought about that? Am I a good follower? Do I, do I, do I now, in the military, of course, we take, we, we take direction pretty readily. We don't, uh, we don't generally talk back too much. Um, it's not good for your health. Uh, <laughs> or your longevity. Um, but in the world of work that we're in now, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there is some opportunity for that. Am I, am I leading well, and am I following well? I think most of us would understand, if you're a good follower, and you understand what the rules are, and what, what your goals are, and it's understood by everybody, you, you tend to become a better leader, because you know how, what's expected of you. Do you show a sense of urgency? Put a little pep in your step. Do you ever see somebody on a, on a Thursday or on a Wednesday and they're walking down the hall and they're, 
Uh, woe is me. It's the third or fourth Monday this week. Do you want to spend time with that person? Do you want to be in a meeting with that person? Do you want to follow that person? I don't. So don't be that person. Try to find a way to put a little pep in your step. Put a smile on your face and a song in your heart. Whatever it takes to help you get through the day. If you're working, count your blessings. We're working. And a lot of people aren't as, as uh, fortunate. Uh, so when you, when you can demonstrate that pep, that sense of urgency, that desire to get the job done, give it to me. Be personally accountable for it. I've got it. Nothing makes a boss happier than hearing, don't worry about it. Boss, I've got it. I can handle it. So be that kind of person. I think that, that'll be helpful. Or do you avoid all of these things? I'll let you read that quote. For the sake of the microphones in the back, let me read the quote. If a man has come to that point where he is so content that he says, I do not want to know anymore, or do anymore, or be anymore, he is in a state in which he ought to be changed into a mummy. Do you ever feel that way? I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm, check, please. I don't want to do anymore. I don't want to learn anymore. I don't want to move anymore. I know after how many moves did we have in the Army? 14, 15? I heard that one. I don't want to move anymore. <laughs> when we finally settled, my wife Tina said, everybody that we know put our address in ink because everybody had had it in pencil for 20-some for years. But when you get to that point where you just don't want to grow anymore, boy, that's a sad, sad day. Think about what else you can do. How can you grow? What, what, would it be, what would it take to light your fire? We want change. Change is difficult, OK? Anybody think change is easy? Anybody? No, change is hard. We fight change. We can't help it. I, I bet I could look at 300 people here, and there's probably a 25% of us somewhere on our resume, maybe more, have the, have the term, guess what, change agent. Am I right? Don't put your hand up if you have it. It's OK. We're all change agents. We all say we're change agents. Do we really embrace change? I mean, really embrace it? Or do we kind of put shields up and say, well, why do we have to change? We've been doing this this way for so long. I'm content. I'm happy. Force yourself to change once in a while. Embrace the change. It helps us grow. It helps us put that pep back in our step. Perspective and outlook that brings me to this slide. If you were to ask this fellow, what are you doing? What are you doing today? What's he liable to say? Obviously. I'm digging a hole. I'm digging a hole. But maybe his perspective is a little different. Maybe he'd answer by saying, I'm helping to build a cathedral. I'm a part of building a cathedral today. And part of that's digging this hole, digging this foundation. What's, what makes you want to get up and go to work in the morning? To go dig another ditch or to help build this cathedral? Think about your perspective on what you do. Um, as mentioned in the, in the bio early on, I'm, I'm, in my day job, I, I work with, uh, with veterans and soon-to-be veterans as they transition from the military to the civilian world. Help them with their resumes, uh, uh, interview skills, skill identification and transfer, how to make their military re um, uh, resume look understandable to, to civilians. How to salary negotiate, that's what they want to talk about first, by the way. How do I get the big dollars? And because they're not used to having big dollars in the Army, trust me, in any military service. But if you can, get, if you can start getting people to think about what, you, what your big goal is. My big goal is, you know, I, I can't save the world, I can't get everybody a job, I can't, it's not my, that's not what I can do. But I can do something every day that's going to help some soldier or some sailor or a Coast Guardsman or Airman or Marine somewhere get a little further up the road, get his resume or her resume a little tighter, and maybe get ready for an interview. It's just a little nudge. It's just a little something. But that's enough for me, for my drive from McLean in my office down to Stafford where I live, to say, you know, life isn't so bad. We, we're doing something for somebody somewhere. It's, sometimes it's like pushing a rope up a mountain. It's tough. But... I, I charge you to take a look at what you do in your daily lives, whether it's your vocation or your avocation or your hobby or with your family. What value are you bringing? What wonderful things are happening because you're there, because you're part of it, and no one else can bring that kind of value, just you? Are you just digging a ditch every day, or are you going to build a cathedral? It's all about perspective. 
Man can climb the highest summits, but he cannot dwell there long. George Bernard Shaw. You got to keep moving. Got to keep moving. Got to keep climbing. Got to keep looking for the next best thing. What's the, what else can I do? What else can I bring? As we get older, maybe the only good thing about getting older, bear me out on this, is that you get a little more content with who you are. You tend to know yourself pretty, pretty well, don't you? I'm talking to anybody that's like, that remembers when the Beatles were together, okay? <laughs> the rung of a ladder was never meant to rest upon, only to hold a man's foot long enough to enable him to put the other foot somewhat higher. I'll add to this, not only do you, do you, you, know, you want to climb on the ladder, whatever that ladder is, not just the next higher rung in your professional life, the next promotion or the next advancement, maybe it's just the next thing you can do and do well. But be careful what wall that ladder is leaning on. Are you climbing up the wrong ladder? You know, I, I went through this a little bit in my life about 18 months ago when I had uh, worked for a company for a number of years, liked what I did, liked what I was doing. In fact, it's the company I'm with right now. And then some of you know that I, I, I left there discontented after a while. I'd been there, done that. Didn't want to do it anymore. It wasn't, it wasn't lighting my fire anymore. I, is this all I am? Is this all I can do? So I left and I went to another company. And three months later, I went back to the, to the company I started with. Fortunately, everything worked. There's a lesson here. Don't burn any bridges, number one. <clears throat> Be nice when you leave. All right. Be careful who, you know, how you treat people on the way up because you tend to see them on, this, uh, on the way down. Okay? Uh, so I was able to go back to my, to my old company. A little different role, but I went back. And it gave me a, what a great lesson in my mid-50s to learn that you know, the grass isn't always greener. We hear it all the time. I know it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, because it's true. The grass was greener, but it was painted green, okay? <laughs> and it sounded good. And I came home from work after, uh, I see Tina here nodding her head yes. I came home from work after a couple days of this new job, and she said, what's that? What's that on your face? And I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She goes, you're smiling. That's so odd. And I had found what I thought was my perfect work. Three months later, I found out that, no, no, not really. And I went back. And then I found my smile again. I found more value in what I was doing before. I left, didn't know which, where my ladder should have been leaning. I said, you know, I've been around the military for 30 years. I was in, you know, ROTC. I served for 22 years. I've, got, I've been around the military in, in my private life, in my private sector world for the last dozen years. I've got two kids in the Army, and my father was a colonel. My mother was a PFC in World War II. Geez, try something different, Dave. <laughs> do you think you might be able to do something that doesn't involve the military? Well, I had an opportunity, and I said, you know what? I think I can do that. I want to go try, test out my sea legs doing something else. Had nothing to do with the military. Realized, I need to be around it. That's, that's, where my, that's the wall that my ladder should lean on. And I went right back, and I don't look back. It was a great three-month experience to have in hindsight, um, and it taught me a great lesson. So not every change is easy, not every change is without risk, but not every change is without reward either. And sometimes you've got you've to stretch a little bit to find out really what your true calling is. Baseball fans in here? St. Louis fans? Texas fans? Thank goodness today is not the World Series night. I'm looking at the schedule, printing it at work. When is the World Series starting? Please don't be on Tuesday. I'll have no one there. I'm a Phillies fan, yeah. so uh, yeah, big deal. <laughs> I'll meet you in the bar when we're finished. Um, it looks so good for so long, you know, but oh well. Uh, Flyers? Okay. Hockey. Who knows hockey? He under, one, two people understand hockey in here. Good. In every society, some men are born to rule and some to advise. This talks about leadership a little bit. Not everybody is born to rule. This guy was. <laughs> but maybe not in a real positive light. This guy, if you remember him from one of the Star Wars, was born to advise. He didn't live too long either, by the way. <clears throat> he got one of those chokeholds, I think, and, and perished. But um, it could be worse. You know, there, are, there are some other leaders and advisors that we don't want to aspire to. 
good old Barney Fife. He was a good advisor, wasn't he? He had lots of good ideas. And Andy was wise enough because he was older that he understood sometimes you just got to listen to Barney, but don't follow Barney's advice. So be an Andy. Don't be a Barney. Remember Superman? Christopher Reeve? I really like the story of Christopher Reeve. It ends so tragically and sad, but what a life. So many of our dreams at first seem impossible, and then they seem improbable. And then when we, when we summon the will, they soon become inevitable. He did so much more for society, for his family, for all of us, when he was in that wheelchair. Because he made us think about what's important in life. And it wasn't the roles that he'd played as Superman or some of the other great roles that he was in, but it was about understanding what humanity was and how his wife, I don't know if you know the story, but his wife took such good care of him and then sadly she died just a few years later. But it's a great story. Christopher Reeve, a, a chance because of his maladies and, and what happened to him from his, uh, from his accident, his, uh, with the, with the uh, equestrian accident, he was able to find himself in a position where he had no choice but to become introspective. Don't wait until something like that happens. You hear about it all the time, don't you? Somebody gets hurt, they get sick, very ill, and now suddenly they become thoughtful about what their role in life is. We don't have to wait for that. We can do it now. And we can start making changes now if we need to make those changes. Don't wait until, you, until, you, until it's too late. Some people change jobs, mates, and friends and never think of changing themselves. All too frequently. Because, gee, it's, it's easier for me to change my kid's attitude or my brothers and sisters or my colleagues at work, but why should I change? You ever come across a boss who has been very, very successful, made a lot of money or rose to the highest heights, and try to convince them that they need to change? No. Why should I change? I've been successful. Well, you've got to present an argument that they could be even more successful if they would adopt some of these new rules of engagement. Vision is the art of seeing things that are invisible. True vision. Remember the vision thing we heard so many years ago from first President Bush? True vision of not, not just what we want to do this year, next year, but five years, ten years. Where do you want to be when you're when you're in your 50s and 60s and 70s, where do, you want, where do you want to be? What do you want your family to think? Do you ever think, and I'm not to bring everybody down, but do you ever do the drill of, of uh, writing your own eulogy? What would people say? Think about that one for a minute. Glad he's gone? Would anybody show up? You know, what would your eulogy say? What could people say about you? And if, and if it's not what you'd want them to say, then maybe you need to start making some changes, whether it's professional or personal or both. Thank you for noticing. I, I appreciate that little PowerPoint thing. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts. John Wooden. And anybody that's had these people in their lives, these are teenagers, okay? They know it all, right? You remember, what's that, my, my friend Dave, Dave Gerber says, when teenagers, when they roll their eyes back, they're looking for their brains. <laughs> Nobody tell Dave Gerber he got the biggest laugh here, okay? That's, yeah. But you know, you know uh, I, I just don't know as much as I used to. Right? I'm, I think, Ron, you said it, I'm too old to know everything. You know, when, you, when you're young, you think you've got all the answers. I've got kids that are in their 20s and 30s, they're just now starting to, to ask Dad, you know, what, Dad, what do you think? And I tell them, and then they just do what they want to do anyway. <laughs> but at least I've broken through. They ask. Maybe they're just being polite. So where's the beef? What are we underneath? What's the skeleton of our lives? Not only what's the meat that we're going to add, but really, what, what is our essence? What are we underneath? So let's talk about project management for a minute and how we can use this. I promised I would talk about project management. I'm a project manager too, so I can't help but, but talk about the, the five process groups. But let's talk about these process groups in terms of our, our own professional and personal lives. Just a little bit. So initiating, right? Am I right? That's the first process group, isn't it? It's been a while since I took the exam. And I'll never, ever take it again. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I will do whatever it takes to earn a PDU, as evidenced by this appearance tonight. Okay? Not all first steps are grandiose. Not all first steps are on the moon. Mostly, they're like this, okay, with a diaper that looks to be just a little bit, uh, could be a little bit full, I'm not sure. You know that joke they say, they're, they're not kidding, 10 pounds, that's about all it holds. Anybody have kids, grandkids? Come on. The best part about being a grandparent, any grandparents out here? Take it, it this one smells. <laughs> We're going to go to the hot tub. See ya. So what are those first steps for us? as managers, as project managers, as leaders, as followers, as teammates. Maybe it's to understand what the process is. It's to understand what the vision is. And if you don't understand, ask the questions. Help that leader take those first steps. If you're the leader, be aware that you're not going to take that first leap off, off the lunar landing module onto the moon. They're going to be baby steps. But start with the vision. It's like when you're leading this organization, Any, anybody that's on the board here. Start with the vision and, start, and then start thinking, what are those individual little incremental steps I need to take to fulfill that vision? Planning. I love this sign. Seems a little obvious to me. <clears throat> but this reminds me of a, of a, of a story about my own dad. Uh, lost dad about seven, eight years ago. Uh, retired Army colonel. Uh, married my mother right after... Uh, World War II, uh, she was an Army PFC, and uh, just, boy, uh, some great stories that uh, I, I can't keep you until 10 or 11 o'clock tonight, but I would if I could. But this reminds me of my dad. Uh, after he left the Army in, as, in the reserves, he became a college administrator, college vice president up in a school in New Jersey. And he was in, in those days, there, were only, there was the dean and there was a the vice president for everything else. And he was the vice president for everything else. And included in his operating uh, scheme was the campus police and the campus construction people and everything that wasn't academic and dean oriented. So we're driving on the campus one day and he was responsible for everything. It was, it was great. It's, it's like, just think Dave, one day all this will be yours, this whole campus. I wish that it could have been. And we're driving on the campus and, uh, and I noticed that there's a new dormitory. And I'd watched it being built over the months. And I see kids walking in and out of the, of the dorm. It's on the main drive. And I said to my dad, and I said, yeah, I see the dormitory is open. I think I was about 12. He said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's open. It's, it's occupied, finally. And I noticed that there were no sidewalks, that the kids were walking along the dirt and, and across the lawn from the main drag and into the dorm. And there was a path here and a path here. I said, Dad, how can you have this thing opened already? You know, there's no sidewalks. They're tracking in mud. And, and I, I didn't come to understand the wisdom of this until... Decades later, when he, but what he told me was, I'm not going to pour the concrete until they show me where the concrete should go. So he said, in essence, let the kids make their way into the building, and wherever they leave a path, that's where I'm going to pour the concrete. As opposed to right angles, and this is where I want the concrete, and then guess what? You get the paths cut across. And it told me, it told me a lot about planning. Decades later, when I finally put two and two together, as my kids will do when they're in their 50s and I'm long gone, they'll finally connect those dots and, uh, and have that epiphany that dad was right about something or mom was right. Plan, 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 and keep planning. And our lives are, are part of that. We, we tend to plan at work, but I'm not sure we're always planning what our lives are, our, our finances, our homes, our kids, the schools, where we want to live, what we want to do. Are we devoting enough time to the planning process? Uh, I, for one, am not. I know I'm not, and I know I need to do better. Uh, but, you know, we all, we all have busy lives, and it gets difficult. So let's try to remember the importance of planning. Executing. This is the rebuilding of ground zero. Um, it just reminds us that we can rebuild, we can change, and we can become perhaps, if not better, certainly different or just as good when we start to, when we go through that process and as we execute whatever changes we're making, whatever new innovations we bring into our lives, the execution phase is critical as we look back and, and, and participate with others in the building of a new enterprise or the building of our new selves. Monitoring and controlling. You know, 
this is probably what we try to spend most of our time on is controlling our lives, right? Controlling and where, how we're feeling, where we're going, how much gas prices are, how much milk costs. We're always monitoring and, and trying to control. Unfortunately, I think we, we probably don't sense the control that we'd like to have. We monitor a lot, and then we are upset a lot because we don't have the control that we'd love to have. Um, so what can we do to change that? What, what, can we take charge of our lives? I asked rhetorically. I don't have the answer. But it's important for us to think about what, what, what can we control, and are we taking the steps necessary to, to exercise that? In closing, of course, every chapter has a close. Okay, the board members that are here working today as board members will one day not be board members. Other folks that haven't been will join the board. There are changes that are going to happen. It's hard to close that door sometimes. Sometimes it's really easy. But it's important to close it. It's important to close that chapter in your life, in your, in your work life, and move on. You know, sometimes it's, it's time to retire. When I left the military after 22 years of wearing the same kind of uniform for a long time, uh, those who have retired, it's difficult. I, I hung up the uniform, put it in the closet, I visited it once a day, <laughs> then once a week, I would put it on occasionally, and when I got to the point where I couldn't put it on anymore, <laughs> I was fine. It's the, the button alert, you know, these could go at any moment, so be careful. Um, Change is difficult. When you're leaving, leaving a career after two decades plus, that's a hard thing to do. But we have to remember, too, we also left our, our home and our family two decades prior to go do something like join the military. I tell these, these kids uh, that are leaving the service, you know, uh, sir, this is going to be so hard. I've, all I've ever done was, was, you know, I was a fireman in the Navy on board, a, on board an aircraft carrier. All I've ever done was be a, a med tech. All I've ever done was be an MP. I don't, I don't know how to do anything else. I'm afraid of the change. And I say, you know, the change from the military to the civilian world is not as difficult, I think, as the change from the civilian world into the military. There's nobody yelling at you when you get out. <laughs> Maybe your mother and your father, if you decide you want to go back home. Please don't let that happen. Remember, it's time, sometimes appropriate to close the door. If you don't like what you do, you won't do what you do as well as you'd like. Everybody remember that? There's a test. But this has been so true in my life, I suspect it's true in all our lives. If you don't like what you do, you're probably not going to do a very, very good job at it. It's going to be really challenging to do a good job. You're a better person than I am if you can do a great job doing something that you just hate to do. That's why I hate to vacuum. I hate to clean the house. I love to cut the grass. Because I don't have to vacuum if I'm busy cutting the grass. But at work, are we doing what we like? Are we doing what we love? If we're not, gee, are we, are we really doing it as well as we can? It's really challenging to do that. So it's another reason to, to think about what you can do that you really like to do, what your skills are, where your passion is, and try to do that. Because you'll probably do a, a much better job. Now, there's the big H again. Are we being happy? Are we getting back to what makes us happy? All right, we're going to see if we can make this work. I haven't done this before. And I, any IT people out there? David, don't you leave this building. Anybody know who Paul Potts is? You remember Paul Potts? There's a show called, or was a show called, um, Britain's Got Talent. I'm good so far. You know America's Got Talent? You've, you've seen that? It's kind of like the American Idol. Uh, Simon Cowell was on it. Well, there was a predecessor to it called Britain's Got Talent, 2007. And this guy, Paul Potts, I'm going to show you a short video here was a contestant. And Paul, as you see here, um, was a, a manager at something called Carphone Warehouse in Cardiff, England. And he decided to audition for this show, Britain's Got Talent. So just take a couple of minutes and let's watch this. That's Paul Potts today. He's worth over $5 million. He's performed before the Queen. He's been on national television here in the United States many times. He's got three or four gold albums, and he was a car phone salesman. But he found something else. He, he took a risk. He tried something new. And 
Fortunately for him, and for those of us who like his voice, uh, it worked out. But you know, if you don't try, what happens? Nothing. Uh, for my baseball fans, you know, you can't steal second base unless you what? Take your foot off first. You've got to do something positive for something positive to happen. And I, when I first saw this, I think I watched it every morning for about two weeks <laughs> just to get charged up. Um, what an inspiration. And, you know, there have been others since, you know, Susan Boyle and, and many others. But I, I thought his, his story was, was amazing. Um, we talk about, you know, cliches. Well, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Anybody ever hear of Jim Greengrass? Philly fan? Okay. Jim Greengrass came into the league uh, with the Reds and played for the Phillies, came in in 1952. And, you know, his first day at, in, uh, in the professional uniform, he uh, went four for four at the plate, had four, four base hits and four tries. And he made a great catch in the outfield. And he was touted as the next best thing coming down the pike for the, for the Cincinnati Reds and then subsequently the Phillies. Uh, one person in this room has ever heard of him, and I didn't until I came across him. How about this guy? He came into the league the same year, from the Negro Leagues into the big leagues, and on his first day with the then Boston Braves, went 0 for 4 with three strikeouts, and he made an error in the field. And he was touted as, get out of, get out of the, find a, find a day job. This is not what your calling is. Anybody know who that is? That's Hank Aaron. 755 home runs, Hall of Fame, one of the, voted by Sporting News, one of the five best baseball players to ever walk the earth. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Jim Greengrass had a five-year career, he did okay. Nobody knows who he is except the Greengrass family and the two of us. <laughs> not that that's a barometer of success, but it is in the entertainment world and in the world of sports. Anybody know the story of Three Frogs? This kind of gets a, a lot of different topics here. Anybody know the story of Three Frogs? Three frogs are sitting on a lily pad, and one decides to jump off. How many are left? Three frogs are sitting on a lily pad. <laughs> <clears throat> and one decides to jump off. How many are left? Three. Three, because deciding doesn't make it so. You can decide to do all kinds of things. I've decided to go on a diet. Does it look like I've done it? <laughs> I didn't expect that much laughter, but you know. <clears throat> I'm uh, self-conscious now. You've got you to gotta do more than decide. You've got to take action. You've got to take your foot off first. You've got to make a, the first step. And you've got to figure out what that is quickly so you don't lose that oomph that got you to the decision-making point. The story of this mountain climber who was uh, lamenting at, look, at the, look what he's facing here, trying to get up this mountain. Isn't life sort of like this mountain, kind of rough and rugged and, and high? Well, there was a, a very wise woman in the south who said, you know, if the mountains were smooth, you can't climb it. If the mountain was smooth, you can't climb it. How wise is that? That's how life is. It's not smooth. It's rough. But that's how you get a foothold. There are people in your life that can provide that foothold for you, whether it's your spouse or your kids or your extended family, your coworkers, your friends. Find out who they are and don't let them go. Be one of those people for other people. Help them climb that mountain because our mountains aren't smooth, but they are able, you're, we are able to climb them. I call them obstacle illusions. You know, we, we see them all the time. I can't do that because, I can't do this because. I had a ton of them when I was in the Army. I can't do that. I'm not built for that. I, look, do these look like sprinter's legs? No. I, I, but, I can, but I can figure it out. I can run long. I can run long distance. I just can't run fast. But you figure out what you can do, and you do it. They're all obstacles. I told my, my son when he was getting ready to go through basic training, he got a little nervous. Anybody who's ever gone through basic training, there's a lot to be nervous about. It's a little scary. And I said, no, no, no. You're making a movie. You're the star of this action flick. When you're, at, when you're in basic training, you're not in the Army. None of that's true. It's all fake. This is a, you're John Wayne, or whoever his version of John Wayne was. I don't remember. 
I'm sure it wasn't John Wayne. Who's John Wayne? Was he in the Beatles? No, it's not. <laughs> so you're making an action movie, and you're the star. And every day for eight weeks, they're going to shoot this movie. And it helped them get through it. Again, it's an obstacle. It's an illusion. You can pass through it. That's almost Halloween, so I thought I'd throw the pumpkin in here. Uh, you know, there's a, I, I think it's true, let's, let's, for the sake of argument, say it is, that if you plant a pumpkin seed in a, in a mason jar, that that pumpkin will take on the form of the mason jar, obviously. When you, it won't just grow round. It will grow into the form of that. You can break the glass, and you're going to have a pumpkin shaped just like that jar with any carvings in it and so forth. We're shaped by our environment, just like that pumpkin. What environment are we in? We tell our kids, be careful who you hang out with, don't we? David, didn't you tell her all her life? Be careful who you hang out with. You failed. Look who she's with. <laughs> so who are we hanging out with? Who are we surrounding ourselves with? This is something we can, we can really think about today, tonight on our way home. Who is in our circle of friends? Are they a positive influence or are they no influence or are they negative? Do you surround yourself with people? Do you want to be around people who tell you you can't, you can't, you can't? Or do you want to be around people who encourage you, who tell you you can? I think that's a pretty obvious answer, isn't it? What, what kind of friend are you? What kind of colleague are you at work? Are you a you can and I'll help you? Or we've always done it this way, we can't change. What motivation are you providing to other people? Who are you surrounding yourself with? What kind of environment are you in and stuck in, and maybe you need to make that change. I find now at, at this stage in, in my life, in, in uh, midlife, I don't know, I guess it's midlife. If I live to be 110, it's midlife. Um, again, for the sake of argument, let's call it midlife. Uh, we'll, we'll remain positive here, okay? They're doing wonderful things with medicine now. <clears throat> I find that at this stage in my life, I have more memories than I do fantasies. I'm not going to be a baseball player. I'm not going to be a, a, you know, a, a singer. I'm not going to be a rock star. Um, I'm not going to be a professional athlete. I am what I am, but I can still mold my future to a degree. But I've got a lot of memories. And those memories help mold us as well, don't they? You look into the past and it helps you figure out what the future might be. You know what your successes are, what your passions are, what you're good at, what you could be better at. And those memories help you build new fantasies. And those fantasies can be, become reality. They become a little more realistic as you get older. I don't think I'm going to be a cowboy anymore. I don't even root for the cowboys. Redskin fans, you with me on that one? OK. <clears throat> By the way, did you see the game on Sunday? Philly? OK. Uh, <clears throat> I take it back. I love the Redskins and everything about them. OK. And I, I came across, I think this was Yogi Berra or somebody of Yogi's ilk who said, statistics predict the past. Think about that one. How often are, is somebody giving you statistics or odds? Remember Harrison Ford, never tell me the odds. Statistics are the same way. Well, statistics say this, statistics say that. Statistics are a factor of what happened, not what is going to happen. So don't listen to statistics all the time. They predict the past. You can break out of that mold. Don't listen to all the naysayers. Create a new statistic. Okay? One out of every five can do this. Well, be the one. Maybe you'll be the second one, and they'll change the statistic. Anybody know what this is? Anybody ever read Dennis Waitley? This is someday I'll. Someday I'll do this. Someday I'll do that. Why are we going to wait for someday? Don't get stuck on someday aisle. Don't get stranded there. There are many other things you can do. Lots of positive steps we can take at work, as project managers, as leaders, as teammates, to advance the cause, to be better than, than we were last year or even yesterday. Don't get, don't get stranded on someday aisle. And we rarely find success or joy alone. I want to tell you another brief story. I've got a couple more, then I'm going to let you go. Sarah Tucholsky. Anybody ever hear of Sarah? Okay. I'll tell the story. Okay. <laughs> Chime in when I, get, when I get it wrong. 2008. Sarah was playing, Sarah's in the middle there, playing for Western Oregon University. 
And she, it was her last softball game, four-year career as a senior. She hit a home run, her first home run of her college career in the last game of the season, second inning. Hits it over the fence, a three-run home run. She's so excited. She starts running. She rounds first base, realizes she didn't touch first base. She goes back, and as she goes back to touch first base, she tore out her knee, all the ligaments in her knee. She falls down in a crumpled mess. The umpires say, if you don't round the bases, if you don't touch every base, it's a, it's a single. You don't get credit for the home run. One run scores. So the coach said, well, what if, what if her teammates carry her? No, it's against the rules. She has to make it around uh, without aid from her teammates and, or on her own. These two other girls, Mallory and Liz, from the other team, said, what if, is there any rule against us helping her? Umpire said, not that I'm aware of. So the two opposing team members picked her up and carried her just like this from base to base to base to home so she could gently touch her foot on every bag. And she scored. She got credit for the three-run home run. And that other team lost by one run. She scored. You know, she, she hit the winning home run. So you can't do it alone. She didn't do it alone. They were on ESPN and got the SP award and, and all those things that you should. But what a great story. Even your enemies, so to speak, can be in this with you. We've seen it. We saw it at, during times of great tragedy in our, in our own country, 9-11 and some other times. We saw both houses of Congress come on the, on the steps and sing uh, the national anthem. We see it all the time. Why do we have to wait for something horrible to happen or something sad to happen before we come together? It's, it's, it's a shame, and we don't have to. We can be like these other two girls on her left and her right who helped her, helped her hit her home run just because they could, and the rules didn't say no. Last time you'll see that. Last story, my forklift story. Ron, bear with me. I know you've heard it. And I, I really wanted to have, i got to tell you, right, David, in the back? I wanted so badly to have a forklift here. <clears throat> and uh, PMI, WDC, and PMR, the staff, worked so hard and talked to everybody to try to figure out how do we get a forklift in here. And I was going to have it covered and then unveil it for this. It's just impossible, OK? So um, thanks, everybody who tried. Uh, so this is what you get. You, know, you get a PowerPoint slide with a forklift on it. Uh, 19, gosh, when was it? I guess it was 19. Uh, 97 or so. I was on the joint staff working at the Pentagon, still on active duty in the Army. And we were living in Woodbridge, Virginia. And, uh, you know, if you ever worked on the joint staff, a 12 hour day is a blessing. Just, wow, only 12 hours today? What a great, only half a day. Uh, it's terrific. Um, everybody that was in the Army knows that joke too. Uh, so, here I am, and sometimes six days a week, here I am on a Sunday, I'm at Home Depot. As we all go to Home Depot, and I'm out in the outside area, you know where they have the, the plants and the pallets of stone and brick, everybody know what I'm talking about in the outside area? And I'm out there and I'm, I'm there to buy something on my honeydew list and I'm just kind of going through my motions and there's a guy on a forklift, on a Home Depot forklift. And, and he's just driving around and he's got about a three or four day growth and he's got a grin that was cracking his face. It was just literally ear to ear. And he's driving this forklift. And I drove a forklift a little bit when I was in college during the summer. We had forklift races in the warehouse where I was. Don't tell anybody. <clears throat> I broke a lot of coffee pots because that's what we were storing. But uh, so I'm watching this guy on the forklift. And, you know, I'm a guy, so I like a forklift. And I'm watching him. And it's the kind with the single wheel in the back. And he's just tooling around. I mean, he is just flipping through the, the outside area. And he's up and he's down and he's moving pallets of, of mulch and stone around. And I just find myself kind of gravitating toward him and I'm watching him and I'm just watching, forget what I was doing, I have my cart. And as happens, particularly in the DC area, if you've been in the military, you, you see people that you served with at some point. You, somebody looks familiar. So I'm watching him and he's having a great old time and, and he finally stopped and he came down, you know, brought the forklift down and I, I walked over near him. And we looked at each other and we knew right away, we knew each other. And he turned off the key and he put his arm over the steering wheel and he said, I know you, we served together, didn't we? 
And I said, yeah, we did. I have no idea who this is. I can't think of it. I know I know him, but I don't know who he is. Ever find yourself in that predicament? I was used to having name tags on. You know, in the Army, it's easy. Colonel Smith, Major Jones. It gets harder when you get out. <clears throat> so there I am, and he says, I know you. We served together. I said, yeah, I just, man, I, I can't think of it. He said, you're Dave Maurer. I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> Who the heck are you? No, I didn't ask. And he said, you commanded the Butte, Montana Military Entrance Processing Station. Ten people know that. Now, Butte, Montana is not a big town, okay? <laughs> and that was years before. And I said, yes, absolutely, I did. And then I knew who he was. It just came to me. He was a Marine, retired, full colonel, driving a forklift. Happy as the day is long. But I'm thinking, like most of us would think, oh, man, what did you do? <laughs> what kind of trouble did you get in, colonel? And here you are driving this forklift at Home Depot. So I didn't ask him that. I said, so what brings you here? <laughs> he said, well, I, uh, I retired from the Marines after 30 years. Um, I was, he was in North Chicago when I was in Montana. And he said, I came down here to, to this Northern Virginia area. My daughter lives here with her husband, a couple of kids. And uh, this gives me a chance to be near them. And so we, we bought a house here in, in Woodbridge. And uh, I came over here one day like you, and I was back here at the Home Depot pallet area, and I saw a guy on a forklift. It looked like fun. So I applied for a job, and I got it. And uh, I come in at 8, I turn on the motor, and I leave at 4, and I turn it off, and I go home, and I have a beer, and I watch the ball game, and I play with my grandchildren, and I don't think about this till I come in the next day. They sent me to plant school. I learned all about horticulture. If they make me a supervisor, I'm going to quit and go work at Lowe's. What do you do? <laughs> Work at the Pentagon. And that was the moment. I felt I was feeling sorry for him, and then I felt sorry for me. Because he had found that big H. He had found what made him happy. What made it, what was important to him was his family, his time, the pride in what he was doing, whatever it was. That grin, I still have it in my, in my head. I can still see it. He was a happy man. I've lost touch, of, touch with him now. If, trust me, if I knew where he was, he'd be sitting right at this table because he'd be a great example. But he found out what he wanted to do, and he did it. And it didn't matter that it wasn't the next higher rung. He moved his ladder from that wall to that wall and climbed up just as far as he wanted to and didn't feel like he had to go any further. And he found what made him happy. So I hope you find someone on a forklift someday that will guide you toward your happiness and help you be all that you can be. <laughs> As we aim high, because it's not just a job, it's an adventure. Who did I miss? Because we are the few, <laughs> the proud. Thank you very much for your attention. And as, <laughs> yeah. as a token of our appreciation, Dave, thanks so much for coming out here. We really appreciate it, and we'd like to present you with this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. and, and that concludes our event this evening. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.